um, at some point, someone recorded on the tape. 70s soul music. <laughs> Again, James, I think, would have would have just loved irony um, in that. Um, so, so Robbie said, you all think you can do something with the tape. And this is very important in terms of thinking of work, collective work, um, the intellectual, the kind of radical intellectual enterprise. Because my introduction to C.L.R. James was actually when I was in the labor movement. And I began not by reading Black Jacket, it's not by reading uh, Beyond the Boundary, but by reading the tracks, or I call them back in the tracks, and I would go to Left Bank Books in Seattle and find these, you know, the face in reality. And, and the words that James wrote in tandem as part of a radical collective, a radical socialist collective. Um, and so the work in really uh, first kind of rescuing and restoring, transcribing, I mean, an annotating lecture, I just want to emphasize, was very, has been very collective from the start. Um, I also want to give an enormous shout out to Dan LeBotz, who's sitting in the front. Um, Dan was a tremendous editor in this entire process, because this is very kind of unconventional. You get a call one day, someone says, you know, we have this lecture, the sound quality is very poor. Um, there was another stipulation that this lecture came with. And those of you familiar with James will know that uh, Dr. Robert Hill is his literary executor. Uh, and Dr. Hill was actually quite specific about wanting the lecture to be published in politics. Uh, and so we wanted to adhere to his wishes. Uh, and so that, and through Robbie, Dr. Hill, uh, Dan, Nancy, and many other people involved in this. So anyway, the very end of the summer, this past summer, we have the sound envelope in our offices. And I have to explain to you a little bit about the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Um, we're a university-based oral history program. We have about 7,000 oral history interviews. Most of them are analog. We didn't really get digital until 2008. Um, we have recently, to give you kind of a flavor of what we do, um, as you might imagine, a lot of our interview work has been done with people in the state of Florida throughout the decade. Sam Parker, the founder of the program in 1967. Um, we've been recently really getting into the business of trying to kind of recover and restore um, these types of, of what we call audio envelopes. So another example, uh, we've recently have, have restored, or actually digitized, restored, and transcribed a discussion that took place in Gainesville, Florida in 1981 uh, between um, Francis Bebe, Chinua Achebe, and James Baldwin, uh, who came together for the very first time in, in person to actually talk to each other in one room. Uh, and it's about a three-page transcript. It's actually much longer than this one, because it's three different men sitting around a table talking about um, black liberation. So we got the, the lecture, uh, Robbie sent it, um, and I told my staff, my, our staff of graduate students, uh, many of whom actually have read Black Jackings with me uh, in my grad seminars were, were incredibly excited, but we also had to be very cautious to not be too excited because we didn't really know what we were getting. We didn't know if we would be able to transcribe it. Even if the audio quality was good enough, could, how much could we transcribe? What, what percentage of, of the tape could we really say? Um, from what I know as an oral historian working in the field for many years, the, the tape's original quality is quite poor. Um, and I, I just kind of imagine maybe a Radio Shack reporter, I don't know, the, I'm kind of dating myself now, but if you were old Radio Shack reporters, you know, you need directional mics, you know, one dimensional, very flat. Um, so the original sound quality was negative to begin with. Uh, but we have an amazing digital audio um, or digital humanities coordinator at the Proctor program. Her name is Deborah Hendricks. And Deborah spent, you, you'll see in the interview, um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the explanation here, we talk about the process of restoring this tape. The pitch I want to make tonight is there's so much of this material that is out there all throughout the world. Uh, lectures, symposia that were held in different time periods, uh, the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, we're actually recording this tonight. Um, but there's a lot of this material that's out there that needs to be 
uh, both first preserve. Um, please don't take if you find a little lecture. If you find this this uh, lecture 20 years from now, don't record over it with soul music. Um, but there's a lot of material out there, I think, that we can learn from and we can use. And so I just wanted to emphasize the collective work aspect of restoring and then now transcribing the tape. Because I'm now up to my transcribing part. So when we got the tape, um, we you know we redigitized it um, and began going through it. And we used sound uh, uh, amplitude uh, software to kind of restore the levels. Um, transcribing is very challenging. Because as I mentioned, the original recording quality was not good. Um, and as James is talking, and if you're familiar with James, and if you have, have the New Politics Journal, I highly suggest you get this copy um, this beautiful issue of New Politics. Right? Um, it starts with something, and I, I was thrilled, I have to say, because I've listened to a lot of James' lectures. And so he begins by saying, this is June 16, 1971, and as usual, 10 past 9, I certainly will not go beyond 10 past 10. And I would like to say at once that this is the tax. It is so difficult that it is as well to say at the beginning that it can be done. 583 pages. Oliver Cox has cast class and race a study in social dynamics. So from there, we had a team of, of transcribers working on this day and night. It took us about two months to fully transfer. We ran through, uh, we made about 15 different passes over it initially. We have a process where we transcribe and then we audit, uh, what we call audio, um, audit edit, which is simply kind of, a, um, as you, you might imagine, it's simply people checking over your work to see if it kind of jives with, with things. Um, and so we listen to it and listen to it and listen to it. And every transcription, see, transcribing doesn't work. You don't necessarily get better over time. Because transcription eight may not be better than transcription number five. In fact, it may do great, it may get worse. There's a lot of philosophical material and historical material in this that uh, this Scott will, will attest to. Um, and so we had to kind of, I did pull, pull out my marks, uh, pull out a lot of things that James is referencing to, and kind of re uh, acquaint myself. With, with, with James. I read World Revolution, I'm sorry to say, in about five years. Uh, and so I needed to pull James' World Revolution back out and take a look at it. And, but what, what, what we discovered was James was actually reading out of certain passages of certain, certain of, of, of the great books, World Revolution, I mean, Césaire, uh, Black Reconstruction. This lecture came in, in a very interesting sequence. So let me go into the, the context of the lecture. So James comes to, uh, is invited to the Institute of the Black War. And I should mention that in the introduction, uh, Derek White and I co-wrote the introduction. And if you haven't had a chance to read Derek White's work on the Institute of the Black War, I highly suggest you do. Um, it's a superb book. The Institute of the Black War was an incredibly important black radical initiative. Derek, both Derek and I believe a lot can be learned from that, from that initiative. Um, IBW from the very outset was targeted by the police, the Atlanta area police, the FBI, um, and uh, because they're doing what we work, they would bring people like Sylvia Winter, Walter Rodney, uh, James was invited, and James gave four lectures, um, of which this is a part of, but this one was the one, of course, that got lost. Now, the first lecture, was how I wrote the Black Jackets. How many of you read James' Black Jackets? So, so quite a few. Um, the lecture is kind of a retrospective, and as Scott can attest, many of us have used those the, the three lectures. The first one, how I wrote the Black Jackets. The second lecture in the sequence was um, a comparison between Black Jackets and W.E.B. Du Bois' Black Reconstruction. How many of us have read Black Reconstruction? All my former students have raised their hand. Um, okay, good. Um, and then the third lecture uh, that we had extant was James saying, "How if, if I wrote Black Jackets today, this this history of the Asian Revolution, 
how would I write it today? And we thought that was lecture number three. But there's a certain logical sequence of these lectures. And the reason for giving the lectures in a sequence is to talk about the importance of black cell activity as, as being a defining part of great historical moments, both, of course, the Haitian Revolution, which we're all familiar with, and the importance of that in eventually the larger abolition of slavery, uh, the struggles against capitalism, and so on and so forth. But James has a lot to say about Du Bois' Black Reconstruction. And in his lecture at the IBW, he says that in many ways, Du Bois surpassed my work in Black Jaguars because he was able to, to foreground the Black working class during the Civil War as being decisive to the struggle, the eventual Union victory, um, the Emancipation Proclamation. And when I teach Black Reconstruction, um, and my students read it for the first time, the second, third time, um, they're just amazed. Uh, because very few of them have ever read a book where Black working class people are actually the heroes, the protagonists of the story, driving the national union and national narrative. So that's lecture two in the series. But what we missed was this lecture on Albert Cromwell Cox. Now there's a lot of reasons why I think we can conjecture why Cox, uh, why James's lecture on Cox kind of dropped out of this. Um, when I was in graduate school, my wife can attest to this, there were really three books that I always kept close by me. Oliver Cromwell Cox's Cast Blast and Waste, James's Black Jackman's, and Du Bois' Black Reconstruction. In fact, I think a lot of my peers and professors thought I was quite insane um, because no one was reading Cox in the 90s. I started grad school in 93. And picking up this enormous book, almost 600 pages, and talking to faculty and my peers about how Cox carefully goes through the, the, the kind of origins, the creation, the replication, the, the endurance of racism in American society, and hinging on labor exploitation was definitely passe in the 90s. Um, we rarely talked about labor exploitation. In fact, I remember my first graduate seminar was, a, we, we had a week about E.B. Thompson, but we didn't even read E.B. Thompson. We wrote critiques against E.B. Thompson. Okay. That, Periodizes me in my you know my time period in graduate school, and so in many ways this is personal for me. Uh, Cox and, and Du Bois and James, um, and not just for me but for other people as well. A minority of us. I mean these books were like talismans for us. Uh, these books helped us stay grounded. Uh, these were books that we came to that came to us. We came to them not through graduate seminars. I never studied Cox in graduate school. Uh, these were movement books. These were books that you picked up when you were trying to figure out what was going wrong. What was going wrong in the movement? Why were our unions declining? Uh, why, were, why was every civil rights game we thought we had made in the 60s and 70s crumbling before our very eyes? And that's why these, these three texts were so very important. Um, to wrap up a few thoughts, in, in kind of the silver vein. Um, James talks about Cox in a very interesting, very sophisticated way in these lectures. And again, having listened to the, listened to the lecture, transcribed the lecture, audit, edited the lecture, and thinking about this, I'm still, I'm, I don't know if I used to, but I'm still trying to make up my mind about um, James's analysis of Cox. I'm, I'm, you know, kind of on a few different levels. Um, it's a beautiful analysis. Um, it's an analysis in which the editing team periodically would take a little bit of, you know, we'd say, well, you know, do you really believe this? But as transcribers, that's where you have to say, look, it's our job to transcribe the tape. Now, we did annotate the lecture, so you see the annotations. I um, mean, you'll see that we did put a little bit of, you know, on certain occasions where, where we think we disagree with James's assessments of Cox. Um, if I had a critique of our work, uh, we could have done more. Um, but we did have space limitations. Um, this is an unusually long uh, uh, project to have in a journal, and we wanted to be respectful of that. And so I hope that 
uh, subsequent readings of this will actually elicit more uh, more critiques, you know, kind of more analysis. But to conclude my my opening remarks, um, having been involved in, I'm a, a faculty advisor for our chapter, uh, the web chapter, the Dream Defenders, uh, which has been very involved in Black Lives Matter movement, of course. Um, and again, I can't think of a more timely kind of piece to come out than Oliver Cox's work. He was a person who taught at historical black colleges most of his career. And when people talk about Cox, and this used to drive me mad, but until I read this lecture, I didn't really kind of understand why this, this upset me. But um, a lot of people have talked about this amazing sociologist who incorporated Marxism into his analysis of capitalism and world systems theory. They would say, well, you know, if Cox had only taught at HBCU, like Tuskegee, Biden, Jefferson, maybe you could have went further. Uh, I've always disagreed with that. I think it's a ridiculous analysis. I think because he taught at HBCUs, that gave his, and, and we write this in the introduction, it was a, a strength for Cox. In, but I'm not even sure James can really see that. That's where I would critique James, that Cox traveled in a very different kind of circle than I traveled as a grad student at Duke in the 90s, where everything was about post this, post that, post whatever. Um, Cox was in the middle of a lot of big struggles, uh, teaching at HBCU, like Tuskegee, right, in the 40s, where he publicly criticized Booker T. Washington an infuriated the administration. They actually called him Parker for it, and that that's a famous episode. Uh, but here is a person, Oliver Cromwell Cox, who had polio, who um, struggled with recognition, certainly uh, was frequently uh, savagely attacked uh, by reviewers. Some of the reviews were just really just hard to read. Um, and and who, who somehow um, endured all of this and wrote some amazing books, uh, which I think are just as timely now as they were when they were written. So it's just been working on, on, on the, the, uh, the lecture for a lot of us. I know for Derek, uh, for my grad students, myself, it was a really, it was an intellectual enterprise, but again, a collective work enterprise and a very emotional, uh, you know, there were tears involved in this, there were certain frustrations. We'll see some passive, passages which we're not able to, to kind of place us down. Um, maybe at a later date, we'll come up with with more sophisticated software. Uh, but this is what we have. I think we have about 90 to 95% um, of the lecture on um, this. So, um, yeah. I'm going to turn that a little bit by, uh, by telling him that uh, it is reference to the James being very interested in uh, new technologies and how they can be socially uh, politically useful. Um, in the 1950s, when James was in England, uh, his comrades back in the US were, of course, continuing to meet in their organization. Um, I, have, I have textual references to them using tape recorders that were recorded by the meetings in the 50s and sent them, send them over and so you listen to them. Um, Unfortunately, I have no idea where they are, so that may be in somebody's providing surgery dissertation of the topic there at you. Um, it will well, come the other day. Um, I had a thought and had time to do the math on this um, that, yes, in fact, since discovering the Johnson Forest Tendency in 1988, um, I have spent half of my, well, more than half of my life reading, uh, researching, and thinking about CLR James. And actually, it comes to 52%. Um, now, continuously, of course, um, but with a sort of intense and endlessly renewable fascination um, that Eve uh, Sedgwick probably had in mind when she said that obsession is the most durable form of intellectual capital. Um, so as you might imagine, the recovery of James's talk on Paul Cox from 1971 and his publication in Politics has been a matter of keen interest and close attention, um, and, and that attention is by no means exhausted. Uh, at the same time, it has come with a rather persistent feeling of frustration while studying the text. Um, now, when I say that, I'm not just trying to be contrary or anything. Um, it, it, 
this is this is genuinely been my response to it in the first several readings of, of the of the transcript. Um, and it's not a, a it's not a denigration of the text by any means. It actually, in some ways, it's a it's a it's good to stop and judge your own reactions to these things and kind of say, figure out you know what expectations am I bringing to this? Uh, what uh, 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 am I am I looking for that he isn't doing? What is he doing that I'm not looking for? Um, so with that uh, very much uh, in mind, I, I want to try to talk about three areas in which um, I found this frustration taking, taking kind of interesting uh, directions. Um, so those three areas are biographical, political, and uh, finally, uh, I would say, intellectual formation and framework. And I'll start with the biographical. Um, uh, Paul's introduction refers to, to James and Cox being both from Trinidad, um, which is certainly true there. But, but not just that, in the book born in 1901, James was only a very few months older than Cox. My understanding in 1901, circa 1901, uh, Trinidad had about 10,000 people. Uh, James's father uh, was a school teacher and apparently a pretty rough one, pretty, you know, very, very driven. Uh, uh, Cox's father, we know very little about Cox's early, early years. Um, but uh, he never wrote anything quite, uh, quite like James's uh, memoir. But, uh, but we do know that his uh, father was a minor, minor uh, colonial bureaucrat. Um, and that he had an uncle who was very much like James's father, who was very much a little learning your Greek for the sweet or you know, all mocks and sense to you. Um, there's almost no way that they couldn't have known each other. They, both, they were both in, in, in the of Spain. Um, they both end up in the United States for prolonged periods of time, uh, 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 and yet I noticed for one time I looked around and there's no trace of contact or awareness between the two of them until we get this transcript. Um, I, I looked for it and I, I just haven't been able to find any any evidence of that. So there are two flex, there's sort of like two flecks of information or uh, you know mere clues that you find in the transcript uh, that intrigued me. Um, the first is when James uh, says that, uh, that uh, talks about uh, 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 cast cast of grace in the, in the 1940s. Um, he says, you know, his, his wife went and bought a copy because they were both interested in it. He says it you was know, an expensive book and, and it caused, uh, his, his word is a sensation at the time. Now, um, it, it was in fact an expensive book. I did the, the uh, use of the inflation calculator. It was $7.50 in 1948. Is about it's about seventy five dollars now. Um, so this was uh, this was as he says it was an expensive book, but he also says that it was it was a uh, it was a sensation, and and as far as I can tell, it didn't have. If, you, if you're thinking about sensational books on race in the nineteen forties, other than than Richard Wright, you think of two social scientific or, or academic works. One at Odyssey is Gunnar Gun Myrtle's uh, American Dilemma. And uh, the other is Rafe, who's much less remembered. Rafe Logan did a collection, a uh, symposium of, of uh, writings by, uh, by black uh, uh, writers and academics called uh, "What the Negro Wants." This was a this was a big big deal because it 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 it, uh, it, it scared southern liberal editors, newspaper editors, uh, so much that a lot of them just came out as segregationists afterwards because it turned out "What the Negro Wants" is an end segregation right now. And no, no more of this like, like laws against intermarriage. Just like, just that that has to be off the table. That's not part of the discussion anymore. That so these were two very controversial, very uh, much discussed books in the major media. Um, now, with with cast this class of race, I haven't found anything quite like that. There were a few appreciative notices in African American press. Uh, there was a somewhat dismissive thing in the New York Times, and there were some, as Paul said, some savage and some intellectually dishonest trash he took them by people whose box he poured um, in, the, in sociological terms. Um, so, does this mean that James is misremembering things? Well, I don't think so. I think that what it may refer to, this, in talking about sensation, is, uh, is the effect that the book may have had. On uh, James's intellectual and political network, uh, which had formed uh, around his friendship with Richard Wright in circa 43 44. Um, as, uh, the network of people included uh, Ralph Ellison, uh, St. Clair Gray, 
uh, Chris Clayton, a number of other people. Um, and uh, they were responding, they were they, they had a project, they had a plan to do a response to these two books, to the Myrtle, and I, I'm sure that the Myrtle, I suspect the, the, the Logan book, the Logan book once, they were also trying to like, make their claim uh, uh, politically. Um, and I, I would, I, the, the best I can tell from the glancing reference that James makes to this is that this probably meant that, and as you would think, it was a big deal among his intellectual set. Then he doesn't say anything more about it. We find you have no idea, you have no idea to talk about the Richard Wright. Um, you, you would think you would, but you, I, I was, that, that's one of those things that I, that I read, that read and reread his transcript. I keep coming to him thinking, James, talk more about this, please. Tell us, tell us about that. Um, the other uh, uh, reference, biographical reference, that um, James makes is, and this is, this is very anomalous, quite interesting. Um, he says that, uh, he knows that Cox uh, is working on another book on race. Um, now, to get some sense of Cox's stock, Cox's visibility, uh, in 19, so around the time this was being done, uh, this, this uh, talk was being done, uh, around the same time the book came out of essays on the, uh, the uh, last half century of African American sociologists. And Cox is mentioned in that almost as an afterthought. There's not a chapter on him, it's, it's an afterthought, pretty much. Um, and during, during this period, Cox is at the end of his career, he's at Wayne State University, where his close, James's close comrade, uh, uh, Marty Laverman, is, where a number of Marty Laverman students who are later going to form the Leaf of Revolutionary Black Workers and, and other groups are. And so there's a very good chance that this is a matter that he's hearing things through his connections at Wayne State. Um, and, and yet, that's, again, that's all that we really know. That's all that all comes through. Um, and uh, all of those would be sort of biographical details, it, uh, apart from the, the political implications of some of us. Um, uh, in early 1948, uh, uh, a cast uh, class on race was published in early 1948. Um, later that year, James is engaged in writing a couple of, he's, he's doing a lot of work with the Social Workers Party, um, and he's, he's writing the resolution, uh, which eventually published as uh, uh, Negro Liberation and Revolutionary Socialism, and he gives a speech called the uh, uh, Revolutionary Answer to the, to the Negro Question of the United States, which is uh, often taken to be the resolution itself. It's very powerful work of James. It's probably the most often reprinted. You can find it on the internet quite easily. Um, now, we know from the up from the detail about, about getting his wife to, you know, go black, obviously, to read it, that, that this was something James probably read that year, as soon as it came out. It would, you would imagine, have been a factor in what he, he was thinking about and writing about in these major sort of Marxist political uh, statements that he's working on during that period. Um, Cox's argument, to sum it up very brutally, uh, shortly, is, is basically that, that racism and capitalism are inextricably linked. And this is, uh, for anyone who's read Black Jackman's, that is, that is one of the, the taken for granted things that, that James uh, starts out with telling that story. There's the history of, of uh, slavery's role in the permanent accumulation of capital. Um, they're inextricably linked, and so effectively, the end of racism will have to coincide with, be uh, coordinated with, uh, the end of capitalism. Now, these are, these are uh, uh, the points where James is thinking and Cox's are, they will converge um, and, and they go in different directions in ways that I really wish that we knew a little bit more about. Um, in, this, in the revolutionary answer from 1948, uh, James, is really summing up his own thinking from the previous 10 years, basically, from the, the ending of writing Black Jacobins, going to Mexico to meet with Trotsky, doing uh, various uh, uh, political things since then. And, and he's summing up his thought. And he says, we say, number one, that the Negro struggle, the independent Negro struggle, has a vitality and a validity of its own, that it has deep historic roots in the past of America and in present struggles. 
It has an organic political perspective along which it is traveling to one degree or another, and everything shows that at the present time it is traveling with great speed and vigor. We say, number two, that this independent Negro movement is able to intervene with terrific force upon the general social and political life of the nation, despite the fact that it is laid under the batter of democratic rights, and is not led necessarily either by the organized labor movement or the Marxist party. We say, number three, and this is most, the most important, that is able to exercise a powerful influence upon the revolutionary proletariat, that it has got a great contribution to make to the development of the proletariat of the United States, and it is, in itself, a constituent part of the struggle of socialism. Now, there are a number of points of, of uh, difference with, with, uh, with Cox on, on details here, and it has to be expected, because as, as the, the one, the one uh, political aspect of the uh, of, uh, Case cast uh, class and race that James does talk about, of course, is, um, is Cox's fairly bizarre remarks about FDR. Um, he's, he's not a Stalinist. He actually is not even a Marxist. He makes clear that he's not a Marxist. Um, uh, and yet, he's, he's someone who really believes that both, both capitalism is being, is being destroyed and overcome, and the movement for socialism is taking place under Stalin. But furthermore, that FDR, by getting in and basically, you know, uh, creating the, so, the, the social safety net, such as it was, was, um, uh, was himself moving society, capitalism on the road to communism. This is a, certainly not James's perspective. Um, and it, it, if anything, a, a lot of James, or James's most distinctive uh, political order in this period, is to look at how the very things that, that Cox considers to be the antitheses of capitalism are themselves forms of capitalism under, under a new, uh, new guise. Um, FDA, uh, the New Deal, Stalinism, so on, he, he calls uh, state capitalism. Um, so, so obviously there are, these, there are these points of argument that you would think that James has to make with Cox. And with caste, class, and race, um, but they don't—they don't happen. They don't happen in this text, and they don't happen in a way that's that's um, leads me to my my third thing here, and I'll wrap up with this, um, which is the question of intellectual formation uh, and um, and framework. Um, James uh, stresses in the talk, in the uh, uh, talk that. Uh, his, his involvement with various groups and circles over the years. And he says, basically, I was able to write these, these books because I was involved in, uh, in discussions with uh, this or that group of people who were very interested in the question sort of held my feet to the fire. I know that Cox didn't have it, he says. Cox was uh, isolated and, and uh, uh, a, a lonely figure. And uh, Paul, Paul responds to this by saying, well, that, that, that uh, uh, James neglects the fact that uh, Cox was part of the uh, University of Chicago sociology milieu. And I would say that um, technically, yes, but by the time he's writing all this book, uh, he's alienated everybody. He's very much a, a lone, a lone uh, 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 thinker. And more to the point, um, while well, well, he's broken with this uh, social milieu that he might have through his academic training, he's retained, he's very much a, social, a sociologist. And, and that's where the contrast with James really comes into its own. And the more I think about this, the more I think this is really a key to, to, to both what has been bothering me and what is potentially really intriguing about trying to articulate these two thinkers together. Um, Cox, uh, let me see. Well, we'll put it this way. James is, well, James, you can, you can point to two sort of major uh, dimensions of his thought. One is he's very interested in narrative and historical narrative, the tradition of historiography. The other thing is he's very, very concerned with, with um, revolutionary agency and, and moments of historical uh, crisis. Cox really doesn't. I mean, I, I, maybe you'll disagree with me on that, or maybe other, others who have read it will, will, will have a different perspective. But I spent a while today going, going through all the references I could find to anything referring to the Civil War, uh, to um, 
like RV, so on, and, um, and um, uh, cast place, class, and race. And there's really just very, very little. What you have instead is that uh, Cox develops his own sort of semi Bavarian um, uh, Max Baker influence uh, perspective on, on class, which is not a Marxist perspective in, in most times. Um, and, and he works out some ideas on this, but he really leaves things at, at a point at which it, it has very few implications for what kind of political strategy, what kind of vision for the future he sees. Um, um, whereas James is constantly focusing on, on uh, moments of rebellion, set with the, uh, the Haitian slave revolution, obviously, the Civil War. He, uh, Cox's comments on the Civil War really are kind of reductionist in, in a way, and they they really come down to, well, this was a break of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the North, northern capital is trying to get more, a bigger uh, landmark. Um, whereas James, if you read his, his work writings during this period, he's incessantly focusing on the fact that the, the, uh, the African-American resistance is what creates, what causes the Civil War. The absolute refusal of to stay in the South, and to cre they create the, the Underground Railroad, they create uh, uh, the abolitionist movement of supporters, and they fundamentally change the ideological uh, landscape of the United States during this period. And you and, and you will just you'll never find anything in, in uh, Cox during this period that's, that's anything like that. Um, so. Well, I could like it ramble on all night, but uh, I'll leave it at that. And uh, just to say that there's there's a lot more to be done on this. I really think that if you had to boil down what James and Cox have in common, the the inertia of uh, the way we talk nowadays would be to refer to uh, uh, race and class, which of course is in the title as well, race and class. And that's certainly a big part of what interests Cox and interests James. But more importantly, it's race and capitalism. It's just the same nature of capitalism as a, as a, a system that needs not just to oppress the working class, but to turn it against itself. Um, and uh, 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 that, that's something that I think he and James both, both understand, both think a lot about, come to different conclusions. I wish I wish to talk to each other more, uh, or at all. So I'll leave that. Before we go into questions and discussions, um, Dan the Box, one of the editors of New Politics, wants to say a couple of words. You know, those of you who have studied film, they have that saying, if there's a gun at the table and, you know, the beginning of the movie, it'll be used sometime. There's a hat on the table. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the hat because I think it's, uh, I, I, I'm going to ask you to make a contribution to this event. We hope you'll enjoy some of the things we brought to uh, eat and to drink. Uh, I think it's a wonderful, two wonderful lectures from which I have uh, learned a lot uh, already, and I expect to learn a lot more from your discussions. Also, I'm very happy to see uh, many of you here whom I don't know and I hope to meet, I, or I said hello to when you came in. This is a sign-up sheet if you'd like to be on the, our list so we can email to you. I know some of you probably saw this on Facebook or uh, whatever random whatever random electronic <laughs> notice you got. But we'd like to make sure we can invite you regularly to these. Um, so uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to take this uh, hat and pass it around. You don't want to hold it too long, it's, uh, but you know, it's, it's kind of dirty looking. But uh, it'll do the job. Thank you. Who was the hour that the list Like, who was our? Oh, I'm sorry. This, I should have said this, or maybe it was said at the beginning. Uh, this is a forum sponsored by New Politics. And New Politics is the journal that published this article um, that is being discussed here tonight. And uh, we'd love for you to buy a copy. Its uh, cover price is five bucks. Uh, we'd be ha uh, seven bucks, rather. We'd be happy to have you take one for five dollars to take a look at it. And if you can't afford that, see me, and I'll uh, <laughs> we'll negotiate. 
Okay. It is a wonderful illustration of C.L.R. James, an, an original illustration, right? Yes. Yeah, that was based on uh, our uh, um, Lisa Lyons, who's done our drawings for many years, and she actually did a lot of research looking into descriptions and drawings of uh, C.L.R. James in an attempt to capture what she thought was a, a more true to him, who he really looked like, who he really was. Though, the most famous picture of him is all on the extremely popular Jacobin magazine, you know, which is that uh, profile uh, picture of him based on a very uh, famous uh, picture, of course, a black Jacobin after C.L.R. James, a book tying up back to the Jacobin magazine. So that, that's this around here. Yeah, I just wanted to say something about our third speaker, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, um, but uh, Reggie Wilson is an African-American um, uh, college professor and uh, ad, um, administrator who worked with James in Detroit in the 60s. So I was very interested to get his personal reminiscences. Um, I was in Ann Arbor at the time, um, part of the time, along with Julia, and we knew some of the same folks. And to have his perspective, um, you know, working with those people. Um, would have been very interesting. Uh, for me, I mean, I've read some James, starting with you know, the Black Jacobins, and then read some very abstract, philosophical, Hegelian Marxist stuff, and I was so intrigued. Um, I actually read some of his cricket things, but I didn't understand a thing. I mean, he was, you know, a man of uh, vast interests and scholarship, and... Um, I would have been, you know, interested to learn what he was like to work with uh, in person. I saw him once when he um, spoke at a, um, a public lecture about Solidarność, the movement in Poland. He was very elderly at the time, but he was still a very imposing presence. Um, anyway, uh, so you can uh, raise anything you want, questions, comments. Um, Anyone want to start? I see a hand up. Okay, right. Jason. Um, this may not have a, a, a direct connection to what's been spoken about so far, but it is something I'm curious about. Uh, the word intersectionality is very much in vogue these days. Um, more often than not, it is used to describe the existence uh, of overlapping forms of oppression without ever interrogating what the common root of most of, of at least some of these oppressions might be. Particularly, there is a there might be an acknowledgement that there is uh, racism and something called classism, which is one of those words that is rather ambiguous. Um, I could probably answer the question myself. I am curious what James might say in response to the very earnest and, and sincere young folk who want to combat all forms of oppression but don't have any explanation as to where these forms of oppression come from or whether any of them have any innate connection to one another. They just happen to overlap. It's an excellent, excellent question and observation. And James um, could talk about everything he raised for hours and hours and hours. Um, in terms of, of the lecture, what's interesting in the way to respond to your question is that James use, uses talks in, in James's analysis of the past class and race to open broader pathways of discussion, broader pathways of struggle, if you will, because he uses the text to talk about Cox's interpretation and analysis of the development of, of capitalism in, in Europe and Western civilization. And James suggests that Cox is wonderful in terms of analyzing the way power works, the way capitalism works. But as Scott points out, Cox is not quite a Marxist. Now, Cox uses Marxist methodologies and points to, to interrogate capitalism. But Cox, even in his very end of his career, as Scott alluded to, and, and this is a wonderful question to raise, 
the connection, was there a connection with Marty's labor movement in the state? I mean, I talked to to Marty uh, many, many occasions. Never, unfortunately, why did I think about talking about it? It's just, it, to me, there's a lot of, a lot of tragedies here. But, um, but I think Cox, towards the end of his career, what we do know is that Cox would talk about the positive elements of capitalism to students who, in the late 60s, early 70s, are, are, want to be anti capitalists. They don't want to hear about um, the very progressive stages you know, of capitalism. They want to, to get to the heart of an anti capitalist critique. But James used his past class and race, I believe, to open a window into I mean, Cesare, to open a window into other critiques of capitalism to suggest that, yes, to uh, what allows Cesare to, to, to come to a rejection, if you will, uh, in an analysis that Western civilization in itself is inherently flawed. I mean, James kind of uses Cox in a way to get to that point uh, by suggesting that Cox doesn't quite, you know, he never, it's very interesting because he has this critique of Cox, but he doesn't want to say that, well, Cox is not a smart man because he doesn't believe that. Cox is quite brilliant. It's just that Cox is working these different circles. But in the lecture itself, in terms of intersectionality, the analysis is that we can talk about these various forms of oppression. That's, that's very important to understand the, what these various forms of oppression are rooted in. Uh, Cox, I believe, had a really amazing analysis um, of labor oppression and, and the intersections and intersection between race and, and labor. Um, but James would suggest that underlying all of this are the, the, the grave deformities of Western civilization and capitalism that really have to be worked out. Remember the phrase we used to use, socialism or what? Or barbarism. This is imminent in this lecture. It's very much so. And so you can talk about intersectionality, but unless you, you take you can kind of drill down deeper, you're still kind of working at the surface of Sorry about that long response. Well, I'll just uh, uh, add a couple of things. Um, one, one is that, in a way, James, and more importantly, James and his group, his uh, associates, his co thinkers, and uh, political comrades, are, are doing intersectionality before anybody's come up with that particular bit of jargon. Uh, and I rather doubt that they would use that particular bit of jargon. Um, in the early 1950s, uh, they, they published a newspaper. Correspondence, which is the, the main the creative group that, uh, that Reggie was in, uh, in which they they had young people, women, uh, uh, people who had been interned in the, the Japanese concentration camps during World War II. Uh, a black uh, factory worker, uh, auto worker, was the editor, of, uh, the, uh, columnist in the paper, and, and uh, a Sunday editor, and. And the, 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 the way these different oppressions uh, interact was really the, the, what they were trying to get people, they didn't want to write about it, they wanted to get the people who were living through this stuff to write about it, right? And um, it was a terrible time. Early 1950s were not a good time to be inventing the new left. And that is effectively what they did. The awful lot of the stuff you think of as being 1960s, 1970s, they saw they're doing in Detroit in the early 1950s with so the FBI doing everything you can to shut them down. Um, and, uh, and so I, 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 I hope that partly addresses your question, because they, they, I don't think that they theorized it particularly well about what, how these oppressions were, were uh, determined or determining for one another, um, but they, they, were, they very much wanted to, to do something with it in practice. And, and that was their politics, that was their sense of what was, what, they wanted to do that for the future, that the kind of revolutionary movement that would emerge would have to be one in which there was, there was a space for these kinds of, of conflicts to be addressed and hashed out in a way that, unlike, unlike now, in which we're, we're, where there's really no sense of a, of a way that we ever get past this shit, mm -hmm. um, which really, I think, causes a lot of the intersectionality discussion to just go down a blind alley. Um, they, they took it as a given that this could be, and would be, and inevitably, in fact, uh, favorite changing word, uh, 
uh, would, would, would be a salt for right. Sunday. And, and just to follow up on the points that Scott is, is illuminating, I think, uh, I mean, this is critical to think about how James and the correspondence group were saying, we're not the ones who are going to come up with the analysis. We're not the ones who are going to come up with the, the, the pathway of revolution. We're looking for to, to connect to workers, to women, to survivors of the Japanese internment. Um, we're looking for them to speak their narratives. And, and this is where I think there is contemporary connection to discussions of intersectionality. Because last night at the, um, I gave a talk at the Columbia Law History Program, and I was talking about George Broadway and the amazing work he did with the um, ex slave narratives. And part of the reason that George did that work, he tells us, he told us before he passed away, was um, that James really pushed him. Um, and, he, and James said, is there a way that you can, we can tell the, the, tell the African-American story, tell the story of Africans in slavery um, without having to constantly rely on the perspectives of, of the slave masters? Um, and this is one of the things that pushes Robert to, to make this amazing, it isn't just Robert, it's Ken Lawrence and many other people as well, to make this amazing national effort to re recover and restore um, the ex slave narratives from the 1930s, the WPA, and, and why they thought it was so important, again, to highlight um, the voices of the oppressed. So it isn't just, you know, people in the educated bourgeois classes or so on and so forth who are actually speaking these things. But yeah, just. In your talk about C.L.R. James and his emphasis on the independence um, of the black struggle, the independent contribution to the socialist struggle, I think back to the kind of critiques of Adolf Reed and Cedric Johnson, who really problematized the whole concept of the black freedom struggle, even looking at the 50s and 60s, because there was a lot of class division. There was some basis of unity in opposing Jim Crow. But different classes within that freedom movement had different agendas and, and different interests. Um, but it's really problematic to use that framework today and unproblematically kind of grab James's arguments in the 40s and 50s to today when you look at the black, you know, so called Black Lives Movement, um, which, you know, drawing on, 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 on critiques by Cedric Johnson and Reed, who argue that even that term, that the way they framed it, obscures the real class divisions. Who's getting killed? Not just disproportionately um, black working class. Uh, and a lot of whites, too. I mean, actually, today, the majority that are killed by the cops are whites. According to the Guardian, the only one that you know, calculates this stuff. Uh, but it also obscures who is this leadership you know, their embeddedness in the NGO movement, uh, Teach for America. Um, so I was just wondering if you could maybe, you know, uh, respond to that, the problem, you know, the problem of using that framework to change today. Well, I think that people are, are working at in these critiques. Um, you mentioned Senator Johnson, Senator Robinson, or Senator Johnson? Senator Johnson, yeah. Okay. He's first recently in the, in the Jack okay. Okay. He's got a really good book on the Black Power movement. I just want to make sure because I had an event two weeks ago, uh, someone meant to say Cedric Robinson and said Cedric Johnson instead, so I just wanted to... No, Because I was thinking about Cedric Robinson when we were doing the, the transcript and, and his work on Black Marxism, which, by the way, I think is a really good text, which gets to some of the tensions that you're raising about Certainly, I mean, what Cedric Robinson was concerned about when he was writing Black Marxism was, and he looked care, very carefully at, at Sailor James, uh, Du Bois, uh, Cox to a lesser extent, but Cox is in Black Marxism, uh, which was reprinted by UNC Press about 10 years ago. Uh, Robin Kelly did, wrote a wonderful foreword. But in that book, Ro Cedric Robinson does the same kind of analysis that you're, you're kind of calling for now. He problematizes Du Bois and James's pathway to socialism. And he talks about how 
you know, W.E.B. Du Bois is not the typical African American of 1900. Um, there are many, many different layers and complexities and class divisions in black communities in 1900, just as there are in 2016. Uh, and the same with James. He says, you know, clearly C.L.R. James is not, C.L.R. James is not the typical person in any time period. Um, he, he, it, there was a certain level of, of um, analysis uh, about James, which some, sometimes forgets this, this point you're making. But I would say now, what we see happening, or, or I guess I'll throw up what I see happening in contemporary social movements in response to what Adolf Reed has said, um, a lot of my former students do go into Teach for America, do go into the NGO kind of complex, um, but then cycle through that. And see, they go in now in a different way than they went in five or eight years ago. And I won't write a TFA recommendation letter unless the student agrees to read a critique or critiques of TFA. Some of these students have to do this. There's no other, especially first generation students of color, have no other option in many cases. I mean, my option as a student of color in 1982, I graduated from high school, was to go to the United States Army. And that was it. And I mean, I was on a panel where someone asked me, "Do you find it problematic that James James Baldwin, you know, had a connection to the State Department?" And my my answer was, "Do you find it problematic that I served in the Seven Special Forces uh, from 1982 to 1986?" I'm not, not trying to be facetious. What I'm saying is that these differences or these these different experiences that young people have now in what we call the nonprofit kind of industrial complex, uh, for a lot of us, is just we, we can't escape that. That's kind of the world we live in. Um, but, I, but I'm seeing that, um, even some students I have, former students in this room, um, are developing critiques of that, um, of those uh, uh, structures, right? And especially TFA, I have some former students who have written some very pointed analyses of that, uh, of that program. But at the same time, they're struggling with debt, uh, the fact that their parents can't give them any, you know, any, any money whatsoever, and so they have to win these things. Uh, but that's just kind of a response. These are very important points to raise. I'm boring. I don't have anything. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Address your question. Maybe go on for one. Okay. Um, other comments, questions? Yes. Hello. Um, I'm not very familiar with James and not all Cox. So I'm interested in you all's information about sort of what they say about actually bringing in this, like creating a black movement. Um, like, I'm thinking today, just like, oh, you know, there's very few people of color in this room. They're very right room. talking about, you know, black liberation and stuff. So, like, how, I guess, yeah, just sort of that, what they had to say about actually getting black people in spaces to do. Well, I, I think Scott, you want to... Well, and this is, uh, maybe, maybe it connects up with the previous question. We, we can talk about that, but what James, James uh, has to say about it is very uh, specific to his period of time. Um, that is actually why he comes to the United States in 38, 39, is to, is to uh, uh, discuss these kind of strategic questions with, with uh, his American associates and with, uh, with Leon Trotsky. And they, they sort of they brainstorm ideas on things that would actually work. And one of the ones, that, one of the, the tactics that comes up in the discussion with Trotsky that is really striking is effectively what becomes the uh, the, um, uh, uh, the desegregation movement in the South, having people go into the coffee shop, bit by bit, and refuse to leave until they're served. Um, now, obviously, that's not a, a form of you know something that, that needs to be done today in the same way. So I don't know that you can. I, uh, it's hard. To know how to extract from James and his co thinkers principles that are sort of timeless and can be used now. Um, I think, I think uh, he, he would 
he would simply he, he, he would encourage you to, to study examples of it having worked in the past. And he spent a lot of his energy trying to write about those things. So that was uh, uh, history of Pan African Revolt, um, and particularly um, uh, the Black Giants, or his efforts to like look at moments when those things happened and when they were really, really successful and powerful. Um, I, I don't think he, he had any uh, any shortcuts or any uh, you know. The question you're asking is, an, uh, you know, it's an internal question. You know, how do you create uh, movements of liberation? African Americans at the center of those movements, um, this is partially why the Institute of Black Gold was created um, in the early 70s, where James gave the lectures. And when you listen to the interview, James is going through these texts that we mentioned, Black Jacobins, Black Reconstruction, Cast, Class, and Race. And you can imagine the students at those, um, at the, really their workshops more than just lectures. And you can hear people turning pages. And these are young activists, uh, your age, your age. And, and it's, it's a very interesting uh, mix of people who are there to learn about the broader anti-colonial movements of the early 70s. And it's really fun to actually listen to James say, now turn to page 286 in the Black Chinese. Or at one point in, in the Q&A period, a student says, I have a question on page 196 of Cast Class and Race, and James says, I love a question that begins with a page number, right? James felt that close studies of, of revolution, revolutionary moments was really important. But at the same time, and this is where I think people have argued over James's you know, legacies and his interpretations, very productively argued, I think, um, is in his discussions of spontaneity. You know, where the revolution does come from, and how do you um, how do you recruit people? That that's un underlying. If I understand your question correctly, you're talking about really a question of, of recruitment, anymore. and that's what a lot of a lot of us continue to grapple with. Is you know we can be opposed to capitalism, we can be opposed to police brutality, we can be opposed to neoliberalism, and that's wonderful, um, but. Then another question is, well, how do you recruit people to a movement to actually fight these various forms of, of oppression? Uh, and the short answer is we have to relearn this. Every generation, uh, and when I say generation, I don't mean like 10, 20 years, I mean like probably every six months in some ways. <laughs> um, it's, it's a challenge, but I think I think Scott would agree with this that James is part of so many different radical left formations use kind of an abstraction in itself. And in part, that's one of the underlying questions that I see running as a thread through everything. Even black Jacobins, it begins wonderfully, and my students are so captivated by this because James says, look, I want to be, I want to begin by taking you to an island which is essentially a death camp. It, it, it's a place where more people are dying, where, where African people are dying in slavery at such a high rate of death. They cannot even reproduce themselves. And you cannot, it's beyond my ability to, to communicate to you how brutal this environment is. And at the beginning of this narrative, dear reader, when one white man walks into a group of African sugarcane workers who are all wielding machetes, when one white man walks into that group, hundreds of them, they tremble, they shake with fear because of what that one man represents to them. But halfway through this text, dear reader, they're going to create the most remarkable revolution you have ever read about in your entire life. Uh, and so that, to me, that that's that's what I mean by James was always was always interested in this question of recruitment of how you get them started. Um, it's, it's it's really the toughest question. I think it's worth grappling. Well, and I, if I can add one one very small thing to that, uh, and I, I have a lot of this the the. The Institute for Black World, go out and find everything you can about it. Read all about it. This is an amazing formation that that uh, it, it, it had all kinds of problems, including uh, uh, FBI and so on. Um, but, but it was an attempt to create a think tank, a, a strategic um, and, and intellectual think tank 
of African American uh, activists and academics and journalists and so on. Um, its rise and fall, I think, would be there's, there's a lot to learn from that. I didn't know anything about it until I read this, and one phrase um, stands out for me. Um, he talked about education for liberation. I hope uh, tonight is one tiny little piece of that. Um, other questions? Yeah, Dan, oh, sorry. Yes. Well, I mean, Paul, you can give her a more concrete example, like the Green Defenders, a student of yours helped start that response to a killing in Florida Trayvon, and they, it swept the nation, swept Florida. They still continue. They work very closely across where they shut down the state capitol for over a month. And they continue, they're using the lessons they learned by reading texts like that to realize that they can keep a movement going. And you know, now they work in all the public schools to stop the the school the pipeline. We no longer the resource officers at the public schools in the state of Florida are now are not allowed to arrest children for being rowdy in class. So they they've learned how to do things like meet with police officers and you know the superintendent of the school. So I think there's concrete things you can do when you see stuff to help start a movement also. Yeah. Yeah I, I would like um, going Following on this question about movement, too, um, I think it's uh, interesting to talk about James. Uh, at one point, he was a member of the Socialist Workers Party, uh, classical uh, Marxist party, Leninist, Trotskyist, very uh, centralized and highly disciplined. And then later in his life, he's, uh, he and Ryder and Sky are, are into this spontaneous mode of. As you say, let the, the workers will do it, let's hear what they have to say, and so on. And uh, um, the interesting you know, what was this change? But it's in that period, you also mentioned their work with uh, the League for Revolutionary Black Workers, or the impact, the League for Revolutionary Black, Black Workers. So it's interesting to think about what's the relationship between going from the centralism to the spontaneism, the influence on the Black Workers Movement, uh, what is, and what, what did that spontaneism mean? Uh, it's given rise to this thing, the now splintered, but many interesting splinters of the Marxist humanist movement, I would say. And maybe you could talk a little about that in relation to this question, too. I, 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 there's no way I can answer any of that in the full amount of time. I'm going to punt, because that's basically what I've been trying to understand for the last 20 something odd like years. Um, the, for James, it's not a matter that spontaneity is is the op it is is and, and organization are completely different things, and one is good and one is bad. Um, any more in a way, really, than it was for Lenin. Um, this organization uh, it can, can come out of spontaneity in ways that James is is very interested in trying to, to understand how. Uh, that's that's largely what Mark Atkins is. Um, he, he tried to work this out in the most stratospherically, most blatantly abstract way in uh, some of his alien writings. Um, but uh, at the same time, he's not ever the way that uh, he's, he's, he's embraced in many cases now by more or less anarchist uh, groups. Um, he's never absolutely rejecting the Leninist tradition. Um, he sees that he, 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 he uh, uh, writes about uh, struggles in Africa um, in the 1960s. He's still very much going back to, to, to Lenin. Um, and uh, so I, 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 I hope that's, that's a gesture in the direction. It's a very big, very difficult question, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know how to say more than that. I mean, you know, Sheila mentioned the Dream, the dream Defenders is, is an excellent uh, illustration of this because, I mean, this was a movement. Um, and these were students, I mean, the, the Green Defenders organized all throughout the state of Florida. Um, I just had the privilege of watching them organize in Gainesville, in the north, kind of north central Florida, and which is a very tough part of the South. 
And these were primarily African American students who initially respond to the murder of Trayvon Martin, um, not simply because another young African American man uh, boys were killed, but because they'd grown up with this, these types of incidents as part of their everyday lives. And I remember in an early discussion with them, we were going around the circle just talking, just kind of like we're talking now. And they were they asked, there was a couple older folks in the room, including myself, and one of the students looked at me and said, you know, um, I grew up in Broward County, and that's the county of South Florida, and it's adjacent to my Dade County. And he said, you know, every day when I was in middle school, a young African American boy, I would come in, resource officers would be there waiting for me. We had a metal detector in our middle school, and resource officers would shake us down, and they would do random backpack tests. And I don't know if any of you have been subjected to these as students, but it's where a police officer comes up to you, you're a middle school student, they grab your bag, they put it on the table and dump it out, and they wipe it through. And the student who is now a university for the student says, you can't imagine how degrading that was for us to have to go through that day in and day out. And you know, they said, you know, very few of us would ever be caught with anything. But after the police officer shook shaking us down, dumped everything out and made us put it back in the back pool backpacks, he'd say, Well, Joe, didn't eat you today. It's only a matter of time. I'm gonna get you again. And this is what these African American students and Latino students and immigrant students and white students in working class communities in South Florida go through every day of their lives. And so in, in a sense that murder um, allowed them to kind of in, in certain ways crystallize get together. But the murder itself in response was not enough to create a sustained organization. Sheila mentioned that one of the next steps of, of the Dream Defense was to actually occupy the capital in Florida. It was the first time, I mean, I've lived in Florida since 08, the first time really that politics as usual has been upset in that state of 20 million people, which has been dominated by Republican supermajority uh, for many years. But finally, this relatively small group of activists, primarily African Americans, really shut down the entire workings of the government. In fact, the government stopped, like you may have heard of, actually left the state during the shutdown. And we, 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 we do not want it took this to get him to get out of Florida. Uh, there was a relatively small group of, of really dedicated activists. But then, they, as Sheila mentioned, they went on, and, and the re this is why the resource officer um, issue was so big for them, because it wasn't an abstraction for them. It was part of the, de the, 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 the degrading experiences that they had to go through as students uh, coming up in the Florida school system. But then they went on to work on other uh, topics or other struggles as well. Voter registration. You may have heard that Florida has some very tough you know, voter registration laws, and there's a lot of voter suppression, and so they've worked on that issue with, as well. But it's it's a great example of a group that comes into existence at a certain particular historical moment and responds to certain things, puts out an analysis. They have drawn, I think, very creatively among uh, veteran activists from, say, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, they have been the, the Dream Defenders and, and the BLM activists, Black Lives Matter activists in the Deep South, have been in close discussion with a lot of kind of veteran SNCC um, and SDS organizers as well. So there's been some intergenerational discussions as well. But those are generally underneath the radar. You know, those don't often get written about as much um, as other. Uh, thank you both for coming here. A lot already. Um, and I want to kind of go back to the first question that was asked about intersectionality. And um, I, certainly as a, as a young person who literally employs this word, um, I also hear it to mean something more about identity and intersecting identities, not necessarily intersecting systems of oppression. Um, and certainly now, when we can think about identity as having uh, more value, certainly being celebrated in some ways um, for being a source of 
um, certain, certainly to be valuable in, let's say, education. Um, and we start to see now a growing like my generation of what we'll call millennials because the term seems so stuck mm -hmm. at this point. Um, very highly educated, multiracial, right? And able to engage in these movements of Black Lives Matter, for instance. Um, and it certainly seems to be kind of this recurring surge of uh, uh, pushing back against uh, racism in our system. I wonder if you could speak to how you, maybe James would think identity plays a part in this push back against a racist system, right? But maybe a failure, not a failure, but just not recognizing the capitalist system in the same way so that we can say, yes, the police are an instrument of racist oppression, but they're not necessarily, we don't talk about them as an implement of capitalist oppression. Um, boards of white people are an implement of racist oppression, but not necessarily an implement of rich capitalist oppression, right? We don't talk about boards being a rich people, but being a white people. So I'm wondering uh, if maybe you can speak to that disconnect and maybe the more incrementalism that we see in pushing back against capitalism versus the urgency of pushing back against racism, from my perspective at least. Well, I, I think maybe we can share that uh, response. Uh, when, when James wrote Black Jacobins, one of the one of his motivations, as Scott mentioned, uh, coming from Trinidad, which itself had a tremendous history of anti-colonial struggle, um, there were major, you know, worker riots against British uh, imperialism and colonialism in Trinidad, literally every five or eight years, and that's part of the milieu that James grew up with. The milieu was that, you know, the sugarcane workers would go on strike. A lot of them were East Indian workers. Um, the black oil workers would, would join them sometimes, sometimes not. They would go on strike. Uh, the British would send a couple cruisers, and in anti-colonial parlance, we used to call those cruiser politics. And sometimes they would shell the picket lines. I'm not talking about lobbing shells and, and artillery from, from our shore. Uh, and so James grew up in that kind of milieu militarized colonialism, right? And when he wrote Black Jacobins, part of what he had what he said about the book after writing, but even in the introduction, is I wanted to really explain to people that what black people did to challenge, to overturn, to abolish slavery. And it wasn't just a gift you know, and James would often say, and, and in the lecture, James talks about some of these schools that kind of colonial uh, elites would go to. And one of the common phrases was that um, if you were the child of a black colonial leader and you went to one of these elite schools, the first time you would, you would read about slavery in your history textbooks would be at that moment in which Wilberforce or the anti-slavery movement comes into existence. So, the, so you, don't, you don't even read about slavery until the anti-slavery movement arrives. So um, what James was trying to do with Black Jackman's was to say, this is not all he was trying to do, but an integral part of it was, this is what black people did themselves to challenge and fight and overturn oppression. Um, so for, and that's an that a statement about identity. Uh, it's an extricable, well, it's not the only part of why that's important. But the other thing I'll mention as, as, a, as a movement organizer is that every movement that I've been involved in, um, and my, I really started with the United Farmers Movement in the 80s when the OW was getting reorganized in Washington State, I my first kind of history workshops were not done in a college classroom, but they were done with workers and with boycott organizers because the incipient movements that I've been a part of, often, very often, the first phase is, where do we come from? Who are our ancestors in the struggle? Franz Fanon talks about this right in Russia of the Earth. It's, it's not the end of the stage, but it's a very critical part of, of the stage of kind of coming into your own, being able to claim, reclaim your sub subjectivity in a system that makes you an object, if you will. So that's part of my... Uh, just to 
uh, going back to the transcript that we're uh, having in the politics, um, if you remember, there's a, a, a portion of that where James says, we, whenever we talk about the history of the West Indies, we always talk about it with reference to someplace else. We always talk about it relative to Europe, but now he says, you know, young, younger people today, and I said, when they're talking about it in relation to Africa, but understanding it in terms of its own history is its own, its own specific part of revolutionary practice, political uh, intellectual practice. Um, now, James did not uh, James did not anticipate in any way, and not, I think, necessarily uh, helpful to us with late advanced capitalism. I want to say late capitalism, but that's too optimistic. <laughs> um, um, but advanced capitalism uh, learned how to use identity and difference in ways that are very much uh, fragmentary, fragmenting, um, and uh, uh, means of of uh, commodifying just about everything, um, including the deeper, deeper levels of the human psyche. And James, James didn't anticipate that, and he didn't have, to have a way to think about it, because, because and this is really, this, in some ways, a weakness of James's work as we try to use it now. James, as I said earlier, really thought that this stuff was coming to an end. There really is a, this, 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 this enormous amount of revolutionary optimism in James um, that, that comes from the experience, I think, first of all, of seeing the Russian Revolution, its destruction by, by Stalinism, the, uh, the, the situation in, in, in Europe.